Welcome to Here We Are, Brad Wero's community talk show. I'm Wendy O'Connell, and today we have Emily Kornheiser with us. She is here on Here We Are. And uh, Emily goes deep into the heart of what makes a community work, grow, and thrive. She's involved in so many different organizations in town. She is currently the director of the Early Childhood Action Plan for Building Bright Futures of Vermont. Also, this year, or last year, in July of 2017, she was ap appointed to the Vermont Commission on Women. So, Emily, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on. You were a suburban New York City girl? Yes, yep. I grew up in suburban New York, mm -hmm. um, fourth generation suburban New Yorker, moved around from one suburb to another. Um, but yeah, grew up right outside of New York, spent a lot of time, you know, taking in the culture. But um, when I came to Vermont when I was 17, it was the first time I really felt community. Mm -hmm. And it stuck, that feeling really stuck. Mm -hmm. How, what got you to Vermont? Um, I, in high school, I struggled. I definitely struggled. Huh. Um, feeling very isolated, sort of at odds with the culture that I was a part of. Uh -huh. And I wanted to go to a really small, intimate college where I could really engage with ideas and faculty and mm -hmm. community. And I found Marlboro. And that was the place to be for all of those things. Well, it is, it is all those things. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things did you get engaged in when you were in, in early years, high school? Um, in high school, I really wanted to understand why I felt the way I did, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is very, you know, that's what adolescents do. They try to find their place in the world. Right. So um, I was drawn to a lot of different community activism. Mm -hmm. I was involved in Am Amnesty International, um, my school literary magazine, mm -hmm. and um, a gay and lesbian anti-violence project. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to Marlboro, I took my first sociology class, and all of a sudden I realized there was an entire academic field devoted to this way that my brain worked, this deep desire to understand how the different pieces of society fit together. Well, that must have been a relief. It was. Actually, yeah. 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 And that kind of community could really support that kind of, this, I would think, the, the inquiry that you had. Yeah, there was an opportunity <laughs> there to dive deeply into the academic side of things, mm -hmm. to read deep history. I mm -hmm. went down to UMass Amherst quite a few times mm -hmm. to read primary documents from, you know, magazines right. from the turn of the century, yeah. and understand um, the sociology of history, uh -huh. and then also an opportunity to do field research really deeply in the community here in Brattleboro. So I spent a lot of time at Brattleboro oh, High School oh. doing an ethnography of that school. Oh, that must, that's fascinating. And, and you wrote something up on that? Yep, You're, yep. Well, I wrote an ethnography that was sort of connecting the history of public educational reform to the current day uh -huh. state of public education. That would be yeah. fun to read. <laughs> maybe. I wrote it 20 years ago, and I, you know, I don't know if it would be fun for me to read, but maybe right. it would be fun for you to right, read. Right. Yes. Or historically, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, could be, it could be interesting. Was the culture of your family socially active? Did you have that as well? Um, no, really no. Mm. Uh, I grew up, I think my family is very intellectually engaged, mm -hmm. sort of a traditional middle class Jewish family mm -hmm. in New York. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone read the New York Times. Everyone voted Democrat. But in terms of really stepping out to be the kind of community activism that really connects you to your neighbors and connects right. you to a dream of a better world, mm -hmm. um, no, I really discovered that absolutely on my own. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways in direct opposition to my own experiences uh -huh. Uh -huh. of suburbia. In college, I studied bureaucracy and grew to really love it, um, to love understanding it, uh -huh. to love how to affect change in it, mm -hmm. um, and to understand how, all the, how accountability worked mm -hmm. inside of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And then um, went into international development, um, working for a big NGO. Mm -hmm. In some ways fell into it, but it was the perfect opportunity to really see the interaction between the huge bu bureaucracy of the US government mm -hmm. and how that affects international other governments, how that affects private practice mm -hmm. in other countries, mm -hmm. um, and to really see what happens when you know you move a few levers. I lived in Armenia for uh -huh. quite a while managing an office there mm -hmm. that was supporting small and medium enterprise businesses. Um, and then started to feel that the work I was doing wasn't quite as relevant as I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. And so I came, moved back to Vermont actually. Hmm. Um, and lived in Montpelier for a little while, doing some community development work there, working with um, middle school and high school students, mm -hmm. and trying to connect them sort of more deeply into schools as a public institution, as a community institution. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then traveled around the country for a little bit, as I think everyone should in their 20s. That's right, yeah. Um, and then came back home again to uh -huh. Vermont uh -huh. to have a family. When you got back to Vermont, um, where, you, how did you dig in? We, I opened a small business on Elliott Street in Brattleboro. Yes. It was called The Weather Vane. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing cafe. Yep. We had booths and we had stacks of amazing books to read on each table. We had rotating art shows on the walls yep. every month. We had live music every evening. Um, it was a real community space for that year that we owned it. There was um, tea and coffee and scones during yep. the day and yep. fabulous food and conversation and wine in the evening. and. Um, I met a lot of really good friends during that time, mm -hmm. and I keep on running into more people that formed sort of lasting relationships because of the space that we created there. Yeah, yeah public space, right? Yep. Public, space, public space, where anyone was welcome, and I remember it well. That was 13 years ago. 13 years and ago. And it's easy for me to mark the time because my son is now 13, uh -huh. and we started it when I was pregnant, uh -huh. um, and then it was wonderful to do it when he was a babe and arms strapped on me and I was, you know, bartending and baking and cooking <laughs> while he was, you know, um, while I could carry him. Yes. But as soon as he started crawling around, right. it became a really an impossible situation to do on my own. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so I was able to sell it and um, it continued on as a bar but with a very different sort of cultural yes. scene there. Yes. My next venture was really to spend some time at home with my mm -hmm. son. I mm -hmm. was a single mom. Yeah. Um, I was on welfare. Mm -hmm. And I reached out for a lot of help, and I had amazing friends. Mm -hmm. And I think that right after the level of really incredible communica community connection that I had being in the hub of downtown and right. running a small business, yeah. transitioning to the social networks that I needed to be a successful yeah. parent mm -hmm. by myself was really, I fell in love. Like, I really fell in love with Brattleboro over and over again uh. um, and was able to thrive you know, was had social connections to rely on. Mm -hmm. If I was sick, I had friends bring food. Mm -hmm. There was mm -hmm. always something to do and someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And then when my son was two, I went back to school. I went to grad school at UVM. Oh, you did? To study economics. Uh -huh. Did you move up there? Yep, we moved you to did. Burlington you for did. five years. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you got another yeah. form of community and another feeling for community. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I love about Brattleboro is that I've been here since I was 17. Mm. It's been more than 20 years. And at each phase of my life, I've been able to see Brattleboro in a different way mm. and be seen in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for so many people mm -hmm. here. Yes, yes. Because there's some people who have been here, you know, I mean, some of the first communes were here, mm -hmm. right? And so we see each other on the streets, mm -hmm. you know, and seeing each other changing in different ways and realizing at a certain point, oh yeah, you know, you've got, you've got kids and they're gonna have to go to college. And yeah. so you, you choose a different career. Mm -hmm. You choose a different way of life <laughs> at, the, at those junctures. You were in a very, um, a public arena for a long time. And then coming back to Brattleboro, um, you went into, uh, it was really a, a career transition, which I mm -hmm. assume would also indicate that you had a real change of inside yourself, mm -hmm. you know, of, of how you wanted to be in the world. So while I was in grad school um, and studying, again, really, I was studying economic development and accountability, and that's sort of that theme of accountability mm -hmm. weaves mm -hmm. through a lot of my educational experiences. Mm -hmm. I started a fellowship at an international development consulting firm mm -hmm. and was traveling all over the place from mm -hmm. Afghanistan to Tanzania to uh -huh. South Africa, doing um, consulting work with the State Department, with the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, really incredible opportunities to see some deep excitement, some deep challenges. You know, I was working yeah. with the mayor of Kabul for a little while. Wow. And one day, and it was, it was really, it was thrilling, especially after like the deep inside time of being a single parent. It mm -hmm. was wonderful work. But I was in Tanzania, um, and this is about eight years ago now, mm -hmm. and I was helping some farmers and some big international telecom companies figure out a way to bring last mile connectivity to these farmers so that they could get market pricing essentially. Mm -hmm. So bringing the internet to rural areas, that's mm -hmm. what I was doing in Tanzania. <laughs> and I looked around and I realized that a lot of my friends in Brattleboro still didn't have internet access oh. at their houses. Oh. And it was just sort of one of those, you know, one of those life moments where I was like, what am I doing? What am I doing here? I think I need to come home. And I went back to Burlington and I left my job there and I went home and, you know, said we're moving back to Brattleboro. And we did. We moved back to Brattleboro a month later. It's and ever since that day, it's, you know, I wanted 
everything I did in this community to feel really authentic to my sense of self and who I was, mm -hmm. that I wasn't ever putting on a performance, mm -hmm. um, and to feel really connected to the lives of people here. Yeah. Well, that's, that's an amazing experience. Yeah. So you get back to Brattleboro, mm -hmm. and you've been to grad school. Mm -hmm. You've come back. What, did you, what, did, what was the first thing you got into? What was the thing that captured you? So as I've mentioned, I love bureaucracy. And I'd been working on the margins of federal and state government for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And I decided I really wanted to go inside. Mm -hmm. So I had a friend that was working for economic services, which mm -hmm. is part of the Department of Children and Families. And I asked her if any positions were open. Mm -hmm. And she said that the front desk was, position was open. And so I started working there. And that's really the front line of social services yeah, in a lot of ways. Right. So it would help people fill out food stamp applications. Mm -hmm. I'd help refer them to services above and beyond what the Department of Children and Families offered. And really just every day helping people navigate bureaucracy, mm -hmm. deep mm -hmm. bureaucracy, mm -hmm. when people were at their most vulnerable mm. and fragile. And it was an incredible gift, one, to be able to be sort of at that meeting point in a very human way mm -hmm. between government and people's needs. Right. And this sort of coming back around after having been on welfare. Yeah. And been really had a very positive experience of it myself mm -hmm. and knowing that not everyone has that experience mm -hmm. so to be able to keep on giving back in that way was yes. amazing yeah. yeah um and so i stayed there for a little while and then i became a welfare case manager um it's called reach up here in vermont uh-huh reach, right. reach up and i yep. became a reach up case manager mm -hmm. from there um, and then started to see more and more needs in the community. And mm -hmm. I think in some ways got that reputation as someone who says yes when they're asked to do things, mm -hmm. which is dangerous in a it's small very, town, very dangerous. Very. So um, I started organizing the meal teams at, for the local seasonal overflow shelter, mm -hmm. which had always been held by a member of the clergy. And it was a very interesting opportunity to see a new side of Brattleboro that I hadn't really seen. So I formed right. relationships with a lot of the different faith communities. Yes. Um, and was in contact with people who were really engaging in what is one of the most sustaining things to me, which is feeding people. Right, right. So that was wonderful. And then from there, you know, got involved and became one of those people who say yes. So started, um, joined the board of the Brattleboro Food Co-op, mm -hmm. became a town meeting rep, mm -hmm. joined the town human services committee where I met an amazing group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of goes on from there. Yeah, so it's, it's grassroots. It's grassroots, and being on both sides of that coin, you know, is an incredible thing too. Because you knew what you were talking about, and you had the experience, and you had empathy, and you mm -hmm. had compassion. And I love, I love that boundary-spanning middle position mm -hmm. where I can see what's happening in sort of big systems, government mm -hmm. bureaucracy, right. and then really be able to listen to people's desires, needs, yes. lives, yeah. and really help those two things meet in the middle. And I think everything I do is really, when I can thrive is when I'm finding a way to bring those two things together for an I, organization. I just love, you say that you love bureaucracy. <laughs> I mean, I don't know many people who would say that. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you love about it? Well, I have a good friend who works at the Agency of Human Services, and mm -hmm. one day we were in just an absurd email chain together. And mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing that most makes most people scream and pull their hair out. Yeah. And I wrote to her and said, isn't it amazing? And she said, yes, it's the most beautiful carnival of all. Uh -huh. But I think what I love about it, um, in addition to just having a fairly good sense of humor about it, is um, the way that people navigate structure. Mm. I think that we all we all desire some structure in our mm -hmm. lives, whether mm -hmm. we know it or not. When we have that structure, and when that structure is explicit to us mm -hmm. instead of implicit. So I think in most of our lives and most of our workplaces, we don't really know the rules. And we're always looking for them mm -hmm. everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. And we're pushing and pushing. This is something, you know, this, toddlers do this all the time, right? right. They're always right. pushing, pushing so they can find the edges. Yes. And we all do that as adults even. Yeah. But in a bureaucracy, everyone knows where the edges are. Mm -hmm. And once you know where the edges are, then you can navigate things in a completely different way. Uh -huh. You can go under, you can go across, mm -hmm. you can go up and down. Mm -hmm. But people find these amazing ways of affecting change yeah. once they know the structure. So people aren't putting all of this energy into trying to understand the structure the way we do in more looser, more implicit organizations. Mm -hmm. 
It's a great answer, that's the and, of and, it for me. and it's really uh, you're mining a kind of creativity that most of us don't even think about, you know, because we're either railing against bureaucracy or we're burdened and victimized by mm -hmm. it. So for you to be able to come up with creative solutions and or creative approaches probably is a better way of saying it, right? Yeah, and yeah. I think those I'd really try to bring those creative approaches and. Um, an explicit understanding of systems mm -hmm. to everyone that I work with and talk to. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we can understand how the system works, we can feel empowered in it. I think that we might be in a time in our history where people can understand some of the value of bureaucracy. I joke about this a lot, but I really, I think that, you know, given what's happening with our federal government right now, mm -hmm. I think that bureaucracy might save us. It is designed to withstand political yeah waves. Mm -hmm. That's what it's for. That's mm -hmm. what the bureaucratic class is for, is to keep on being able to do their work, mm -hmm. move the paper around, yeah. serve people, no matter what's going on above and beyond them. Yeah. So I think that maybe the IRS will save us all. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> you heard but it here I'm first. Hoping. I'm hoping. <laughs> I like that. You mm -hmm. heard it. You heard it here first on VCTV. Emily <laughs> Kornheiser. It will go down in history a little bit. Well, mm -hmm. that's great. That's it's a it's a wonderful approach. And and we see that. You know, we see the National Park Service coming out. Um, mm -hmm. We see all of these big government institutions that we really never thought about before, as being able to step up and say, no, wait, there's a way that things should be. Right. And we're able to see that. Right. And I see the effects of that on our community here, where mm -hmm. we have a whole lot of amazing, engaged, loving folks mm -hmm. who really in the last two years have said, wait a minute, there's a way things should be. I've seen, you know, there's been a bit of a veil pulled away. Mm -hmm. I've seen sort of my path to change, and I've seen some of the pain in the world that I wasn't quite aware of before, mm -hmm. and I'm ready to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And it's been incredible to see that resurgence in our community. Where do you see that most in your life, in your, your connections? There's two places that I think I touch it the most closely right now. One of them is the Wyndham County Action Network, which mm -hmm. we called We Can. Yes. And that was a group of folks who got together right around the last election and said, we have all of this amazing, long-standing activist energy here in Wyndham County. We have organizations that have been on the ground doing really good work for years and years. Mm -hmm. And we have all of these people that are really newly activated and looking for a path. Yeah. Let's put those two things together. We had a big Spring Into Action Fair last spring mm -hmm. so that people could really tour, get a sense of the landscape, and learn more about mm -hmm. the different issues in our community. Mm -hmm. And then over the last, over the fall and the winter, We've been holding a series of, we call them We Can Cafes, mm -hmm. and they're so fun. So the way it works is the first half is storytelling, uh -huh. and the second half is a policy discussion. Great. So they're on third Thursdays mm -hmm. in the evening, and we have food, and we had a wine bar. Last time we just had tea and cider. Um, and we have an hour of storytelling, and people told the most poignant, powerful, personal stories about poverty and economic justice. Mm -hmm. Some people described how they came to the cause or how they came to understand economic justice. Po some people told stories of poverty to make it real. Mm -hmm. And then we have an hour of panel discussion where people who are affecting change on these issues, whether that's through activism or policy making mm -hmm. or education, talk about the full range of options to solve the very challenges that mm -hmm. were described mm -hmm. in the storytelling. So it's this real opportunity for yeah. everyone in the community to come and connect heart and mind yes. and really keep on reconnecting those pathways so yeah. that we can move forward together. Yeah. It's, it, they are so fun. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. And we can, in addition to connecting these two ideas, we're connecting groups of people. Right. So we're connecting activists yeah. who come and table, and while they're tabling, are able to see how their issues are aligned with each other. Mm -hmm. It combines, we have artists and storytellers. Mm -hmm. um, Robin MacArthur and Veranda Porch are two writers who have gotten very involved oh, in great. this work. Yeah. Um, and then we're able to bring policymakers and activists together, right. and then all in the same room, yeah, talking about yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and do you have, um, is it mediated in any way? So I, we, a few different people um, introduce different people, uh -huh. but I do the hosting mm -hmm. and I facilitate the panels. Oh, you do, okay. Yep. So there's some structure to it, there's right? There's absolutely yeah. a very clean structure, because uh -huh. like I said, I think that people do best yes. when they yeah. understand the explicit structure. Yeah. And when I facilitate anything, I try to make it very clear that 
there are boundaries yeah. and they'll help all of us be our best. Mm -hmm. You're laying a ground so that people can actually come together in a way where they can voice their thoughts and their feelings mm -hmm. and also and be heard, mm -hmm. you know, which is probably the most important thing. It is. And then to offer solutions or outcomes mm -hmm. that are possibilities too. The last question on the panel is always what do the panelists want to ask the audience? Oh nice. So then we transition into a uh -huh. conversation uh -huh. in the, with the whole room. That's so great. That's fun. Where do you meet? We meet at 118 Elliott, mm -hmm. uh, which is the old laundromat on Elliott yes. Street. Yes. That, and how often is it? It's once a month on once third Thursdays. Okay. And then the other thing I do that's sort of more direct activism rather than facilitating activism, yeah. which is what we can is, is the women's action team. Yes. Uh huh. Right after um, the last election, a good friend of mine said, it seems like everyone really wants to um, organize around their area of most sort of existential threat. Huh. And that's, an, that's very interesting. It Go is very yeah. interesting. And yeah. I, when I look at, you know, so, for me, the place that I really feel most unsafe in the world today is around being a woman. Um, and where sort of the majority of my challenges mm -hmm. have been, whether that's around not making the wages that I could have or not feeling as welcome in certain spaces as I could be, mm -hmm. um, or feeling just genuinely unsafe or mm -hmm. being unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a space for women in Wyndham County to come together and do organizing together mm -hmm. with really an explicitly feminist intersectional frame. And again, you have a structure for this? Yes. <laughs> we do have a structure for that too. We focus on two things. Uh -huh. One is making sure that we're always learning. We're learning from each other, mm -hmm. we're learning from other causes, we're mm -hmm. learning from history. And mm -hmm. so we spend time at each meeting really having deep conversations about what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. what we want to learn, how people are feeling. Mm -hmm. And then we follow this model of say yes. So, oh, nice. you know, yeah. the left has a reputation for eating its own. Uh -huh. And we're very careful that anyone can propose an idea, yeah. possible action. That person doesn't have to re be responsible for carrying out the action. Mm -hmm. And if people want to do it, they just jump on and do it. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, we see how it went. Mm -hmm. We don't need to pick it all apart right before we go. Mm -hmm. But when, mm -hmm. once it's happened, then we can. So we have this incredible range of activities we do that can build on each person's value and each person's strength who is a part of the group. Different yeah. people coming? Different people coming, uh -huh. some core people that are almost always there. Yeah. Different ages? Different, an amazing range of ages. Interesting. That's yeah. wonderful. We have some women that are right out of college. Yeah. And then we have some folks in their 70s. Is there a new definition of feminism? Are you working with it in a different way? How do you see it? I wouldn't say it's new. Um, and I don't know if everyone on the women's action team would have the exact same definition mm -hmm. of feminism. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's about an understanding of how all of our destinies are entwined. That any future that we're working for needs to take into consideration justice for everyone. Mm -hmm. So we're really understanding what it means to be a woman of color and making sure that anything we're advocating for will serve that population. Mm -hmm. That we understand that if anyone is falling behind, if anyone is down, then all of us are suffering for mm -hmm. that. Um, so one of the big projects we've been taking on is an equal rights amendment in Vermont. Oh. And that sort of brings together all of the issues. Yeah. So it brings in art, it brings in community conversations, it brings in policy work, it uh -huh. brings in connecting to all of the other organizations in our area yeah. to really move forward all of our destinies together. That's very exciting. It's so fun. So in both of these organizations that I just mentioned, the leadership model is very inclusive uh -huh. and um, about sharing leadership. Yes. So the Women's Action Team is a steering committee of five people. Mm -hmm. We make all of our decisions together. Mm -hmm. We assume best intentions of each other. Yeah. And we really try to work things through yeah. as we go. Yeah. And it's the same way on weekend. Anyone's welcome to join and mm -hmm. help do the organizing. Mm -hmm. And we just do the best we can to make decisions yeah. and grow each other uh -huh. as we're doing it. Yeah, and it's, um, it's an atmosphere of goodwill, yes. which, uh, which is a great place to start from. Mm -hmm. Especially if this is what we're doing in our free time, right? We That's right. To, we these are all, to be fun. These yes. are all volunteer activities yes. that you're talking mm -hmm. about. And Emily, you know, I have a list here that we're just not going to get to, but there are over seven different organizations that was just off the top of her head. And they're all volunteers. So we have an amazing, amazing many groups of people who are volunteering their time for a better cause. One thing I really try to do 
is bring together each of those organizations. So whenever I'm in one room, mm -hmm. I'm really thinking about the people in the other rooms or at the other tables that I sit mm -hmm. and trying to draw those connections. Mm -hmm. So when I'm at the women's action team, yeah. I try to always bring in issues that happen on the Vermont Commission on Women. That's so great, because then so, you're informing, everybody's informing everyone else. Yes, exactly. So I try to really make sure that folks at the women's action team are hearing about these large statewide policy yeah, issues, that's right. whether that's recruiting people to give testimony on a mm -hmm. law that might be sitting in the legislature, mm -hmm. or whether that's just being informed about the day-to-day -day work that's happening in mm -hmm. other parts of the state. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm at the Commission on Women, which is a much more sort of official Robert's Rules of Order meeting structure, yeah. I make sure that I'm always bringing in the voices of our community members down here uh -huh. into those conversations so that we're really being driven by the women who are affected by the work we do. So the Vermont C C Commission on Women, that meets how often? We meet once a month. Once a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of these meet once a month. So you've got kind of a, a full month. <laughs> <laughs> do. Anyway, you look. And there are only 16 members. People are appointed either through the Speaker of the House mm -hmm. or through the Governor. Um, and there's supposed to be an even split on parties. Mm. So it's a bipartisan mm -hmm. commission. Mm -hmm. We have an incredible director, Carrie Brown, mm -hmm. um, who isn't a volunteer. She's a paid employee and mm -hmm. she really keeps us all together. Mm -hmm. And so she's available to give testimony in the legislature mm -hmm. if there's a question about how will this issue affect women. Mm -hmm. And so she'll come to the commission and have a conversation with us about that and try to feel us all out uh -huh. about what we think yep. about how this will affect women. Mm -hmm. There's an incredible research staff and communication staff who mm -hmm. support her. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also take on sort of larger issues. I'm part of an economic justice committee mm -hmm. and we're starting a listening tour around Vermont mm -hmm. to understand what Vermont women want and need and to just ask. That's so great. How are you doing that? We're just figuring it out now, uh -huh. but we think we're going to have a very brief series of questions mm -hmm. and commissioners are going to host forums in their communities mm -hmm. um, in places that feel neutral, like libraries, yeah. you know, one of our last powerful public spaces. That's right. And we're going to have forums there, and then we're also going to do smaller group conversations. You've actually got a paying job, though, which is nice, right? You've it is. A, very help, very yeah, much helps, yes. Very much helps. So what do you do there? You're the director of the Early Childhood Action Plan. Mm -hmm. So the Early Childhood Action Plan was created about five years ago. Mm -hmm. A whole group of different people came together. Vermont's early childhood system is um, complex, mm -hmm. as most things are, mm -hmm. but it's made up of public, private, and nonprofit partners who really work quite equally together. A whole collection of different providers that are all coming from all these different agencies. Mm. And so five years ago, all of those different people came together and said, what do we want the early care and education system? What do we want early childhood yeah. to look like yeah. for Vermont's children and families in 10 years, 20 years? Mm -hmm. And so they developed this plan, this very complex, very long plan. Mm -hmm. And so about six months ago, I was hired to direct the plan. So in a lot of ways, my work, my paid work is very similar to the work I do in communities. Right. It's making right. sure that groups are communicating with yes. each other, uh -huh. that they understand the system that they're operating in, yes. and that they're understanding what progress and vision looks like. Yeah. And all of that is for building bright futures of Vermont. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that all those organizations are talking to each other. That's a really exciting thing mm -hmm. happening. And thank you so much. Thanks thank for you being so with much. us today. Absolutely. We really enjoyed it, and we'll get mm -hmm. the word out. Thank all of you for joining us today, and we will be back again next week, and we'll see you then with Here We Are.